Talktainment Radio Worldwide Sound. TalkTainmentRadio.com. We give you a reason to come. The world's greatest radio. We give you a reason to stay. Radio, the way it should be heard. You got the power. The views and opinions expressed are those of the host and guest and not necessarily those of TalkTainmentRadio.com, the management, the staff, or KE World Network, LLC. This is the Compensatory Concept with Mr. Neely Fuller, heard exclusively on TalkTainmentRadio.com, the world's greatest radio. Radio, the way it should be heard. And now, Mr. Neely Fuller. If you do not understand white supremacy, which is racism, what it is and how it works, everything else that you understand will only confuse you. Only confuse you. Only confuse you. All righty, good morning. And welcome to TalkTainmentRadio.com, the world's greatest radio. You are in touch with the compensatory concept, with uh, me, your show host, Mr. Bobby, and also the man himself, Mr. Neely Fuller Jr. And this is definitely radio the way it should be heard. Listen, this should be a powerhouse show today. The phone lines are jumping off the hook already. And I haven't even introduced Mr. Fuller yet. Uh, This should be a controversial uh, show today. So if you would like to call in, and we certainly would like for you to call in, you can do that by calling 1-877-932-9766. And uh, let it go, and Mr. Fuller will be happy to give his take on whatever you want to talk about. So let's, let's get it on. Mr. Fuller, good morning, and how are you in D.C.? I'm still learning. You're still learning. What what are you learning about now, Mr. Fuller? Well, I'm learning that history keeps repeating itself as long as you have the same systems in place. Uh, The way systems, I mean the way that people interact with each other, the cultures that people have adopted while they're here on the planet, in order to go about doing whatever it is that people do on the planet from day to day. And you have basic cultures that are not cultures that should exist. Yes. The basic cultures that we have, uh, we have a racist culture, that's the dominant culture, and then the other, other culture, uh, as which is really a part of the racist culture, is the reaction to racism. Yes. And uh, both of them are two cultures that should not exist. Mm -hmm. People should not be reacting to racism because racism shouldn't exist, and racism itself shouldn't exist. So as long as you have just those two basic cultures, which is really just one culture, because one is a reaction to the other culture, and the first culture is an incorrect culture, you're going to have incorrect results. Over and over and over and over and over again. People have to understand the big picture. They have to understand the entire world system that we are in. What is the world system? People need to ask these questions. What is the world government? What does it consist of? What is it based on? And it's based on color. Color how? The color of people. Well, based on the color of people, how? What do people do that's based on color? Well, they have a caste system, a royalist system, based on if people have color in their skin, that is a category of people who are eligible for mistreatment. And that's it. There is no other culture other than the people who are are of color reacting to the culture that's the dominant culture. And so they have this this reaction to the dominant culture is what? Well, the way it's been conducted, because it's ragged, it is tacky, trashy, and terroristic. Why? Because the dominant culture is tacky trashy, and terroristic. See, we have to have an understanding of the world we are in. All of us, 
We're on this planet. We're not on some other planet. So we have to understand what is the dominant thinking of the people on this entire planet. Because whatever the dominant thinking is, that's the way the people are going to act. Because people act according to the way that they think. That's always been. That's always the way it will be. That's true of every creature, not just people. That's true of every animal. The way that that animal thinks. Why did the chicken cross the road to get to the other side? And how do you know that? Because the chicken crossed the road. That's why. That's what the chicken was thinking about, going across the road. So the chicken thought about going across the road, so the chicken went across the road. Because all organisms go the way that they are motivated to go. If people have a system of government based on the first consideration, when you make judgments of people, is the color of the skin, then that's the way everybody's going to go, white and non-white. That's going to be their first consideration. Yes, sir. I see you really have been still learning. Uh, Let's see. Our phone lines are jumping off the hook. And let's get ready to go to the phone lines. By the way, if you'd like to call in, you may, 1-877-932-9766. Uh, let's go to line number six first. Uh, let's see here. Is that it, it? Line number six first? Okay, line number one? Okay. Line number one, go ahead with your call for Mr. Fuller. Go ahead, uh, caller. Okay, go to the next caller. Okay. All right, caller, you're on with uh, Mr. Neely Fuller. Go ahead. Okay, I can't hear you. I can barely hear you. Let's see if we can get that turned up a little bit. Okay, go ahead. Go ahead, caller. This question is for Dr. Fuller. Okay. And the question is, the young people... I believe that they're they're the ones who will bring change in this um, in this society. Um, they're tired of being tired of what's happening to them and how they're being shot down uh, by white supremacy. Okay, Mr. Fuller. Yes, every generation is tired of what went uh, before them. Uh, because they can see that there are contradictions, they can see that there is hypocrisy. They can see that a lot of people are not serious about uh, people's concerns, particularly young people, who are usually the people who come on the scene with some new ideas about the way of God for going about doing things. Many times these ideas are not collated. Uh, many times they are just kind of what you might call idealistic. This has always been true of every generation because the world has never been in recorded history the way that it ought to be. People's behavior on this planet has never been in recorded history. He's not afraid to die? Hello? What was your question? Do you believe that the new generation today, in the the new millennium generation, is not afraid to die? (laughs) For for what they believe? Well, no more than the previous generations. Uh, Most most generations are are risk-takers when they are young. Most Young people take more risk than older people. Uh, this is why, uh, going back to even just little things like, you know, people, young people used to ask, why did an old man wear a belt and suspenders? That's because he feels insecure, and he, he wants to keep everything nice and tight, just the way it is. He doesn't want to change much of anything, and uh, people get set in their ways. When young people come on the scene, they don't have any ways to be set in. And that's why they sometimes do a lot of wild things that shouldn't be done either. But they are also the people that bring about change. But see, you just don't change just to change. And in a system where you have some people who have already put a system in place, they know how younger people think too. And that means you have the dominant system of racism and you take the people who put that system in place, they have already thought about what younger people are going to do as they are born and come on the scene. And they have already made the plans for them, too. Mm-hmm. 
Okay. Thank you for your call, caller. Let's go to the next call. Uh, go ahead, caller. Hello. Which which line here? Uh, line two. Go ahead, please. Let's see. We're having a little problem here. Okay. We got it? Okay. Line six. Go ahead. Hello? I do apologize that we're not getting through. Line six is open. Can you hear me, line six? Are you talking to me? Okay, I, you're on now. Go ahead, brother. Uh, greetings. Uh, with the uh, with the advent of uh, the uh, constant uh, murder of uh, younger, uh, non especially younger non-white black people, uh, specifically by law enforcement, or could be any uh, a murder that that's uh, subjected on us. Uh, from uh, white people, Mr. Fuller, uh, I'm kind of like apprehensive to bring up to other non-white black people on perhaps maybe some mistakes that we make. But could you explain to us on uh, what we should be uh, doing in regards to lessening uh the possibility of us being murdered in this war uh by white people it's uh uh i don't want to say specifically white people who have badges but uh by murder period on what we need to uh be able to explain to our uh, young people to keep uh to reduce that uh death rate uh in this war okay mr fuller don't be careless. Don't wait until the last minute to start doing some thinking. Do your thinking in advance. And the thoughts that should dominate your mind is that you don't confront anyone who is armed unless you intend to die. Period. You have to understand this. You have to understand this. Under no circumstance do you challenge any person who has the capacity to kill you instantly on the spot. That's anywhere on the planet. I'm not just talking about somebody with a badge and gun. You don't challenge anyone who has the ability to kill you instantly right right now on the spot this is not a time to argue this is not a time to start going into some kind of show business this is not a time to start making your points and start talking about who you are you're nobody when you are confronted by someone who has the ability and may have the will to kill you. When you look and see that the person has something in their possession that's greater than anything that you have in your possession to take you out of this world, you do not under any circumstance give that person any kind of argument. Period. Yes, sir. When you do, be prepared for somebody to have teddy bears on fences and candles and people throwing themselves over your casket hmm. in did, short order. Did you have another question, caller? And you have to have yes, that in yes. mind. Yes, but let them finish. Yeah, okay, go ahead. That's number one. Okay. Okay, uh, to add on to what, what I originally was talking about, what was your take, if you know about the uh, the case, uh, on the 12-year-old who was murdered uh, in the park. Thank you very much for your call. I don't know about the, that case. What's the details? Uh, you you want to know, know the details? Yeah, briefly. Briefly. Okay, from, from, what, from what I gathered, uh, the this 12-year-old had, had a uh, quote-unquote toy gun, uh, and in turn... 
Uh, the police were called, and when the police showed up, uh, they told him to uh, to show his hands, and in turn, uh, according to the information that I've read, that he reached for this this gun that was in his waistband, and in turn, he was shot to death. Yes, that's going to happen. And when it happens again, it's going to happen again. I don't care how many demonstrations you have, how many filling stations you burn down. It's going to continue to happen. What you do, you cannot attract that kind of attention. Mothers have to teach their offspring. We're in a war. We are in a war. If you don't know where you are, you're in a war. You're in a war. Anybody spotted with a gun in a war is subject to die instantly or with anything that looks like a gun. Period. Christmas morning, I mean, you've got cap guns and whatnot under the, uh, under the t- Christmas tree. You go outside with one of those guns and whatnot, you're subject to die. Every, yes, every mother has to understand that. Every father. Otherwise, you're just going to keep crying over these funerals. You have to understand the kind of world you're in. You can't be nonchalant about that. Yes, you're sir. not in Oz. You're in a hostile world. You're surrounded by hostility. Yes, sir. We're at war. All righty. Thank you for your call. Thank Uh, you. Thank you. You're listening to The Compensatory Concept with uh, Nearly Fuller. I am the show host, Mr. Bobby, and we're going to go to line number two. All right, line number two, go ahead. Hello. How you doing, Uh, Mr. Fuller? It's an honor to speak to you. I put you amongst the greats of... You can sit on the stage with Dr. Clark and Dr. Amos Wilson. I've been listening to you for a long time. But I have something to bring forward that I don't hear anybody address. And I think it's a a, a time clock ticking away. Uh, they reported that by 2043, America will no longer be a majority white country. It will be a majority color country. And Europe, by 2050, will be majority brown due to immigration and us having more babies and them not having babies. So I can't see these white people letting us have sex and take over what they built up. So I think they have no choice but by 2043 and 2050 to remove huge swaths of the populations, the brown populations in Europe and America, or else we would just take over. And they have to be terrified of us taking over the way they treated us. And I would just like your thoughts on that. On They're going to have to figure out something. Because like you said, we're in a war. And they're not going to let let our numbers build up to the point where we just take over. Huh. We can vote them out of power. And we can start abusing them the way they abused us. So they're going to have to eliminate us the way I see it. All righty. Mr. Fuller? That could happen if we can continue on the course that we're on, which is why we should be thinking about what the future is going to look like 50 years from now, 100 years from now, 500 years from now. This is the way we should be thinking right now, not just about Ferguson. What is this world going to look like 50 years from now, 100 years from now? And what is going to be the interaction between the people on this entire planet? Because we're talking planetary here. We're talking about the entire planet. Because people are in contact with people all the time. First of all, through the modern communications, and then uh, travel will be more, uh, will be easier between people. So, what is going to be the nature of these contacts? I have written it in my book where it should be. We should be universal man and universal woman, everybody. And we asked what we should be thinking about. And what are the best qualities of a universal man and a universal woman? Now, this is an unknown equation. We're traveling into the unknown. We, are need, we need to be thinking of, of things that never existed in recorded history. And that is a quality relationship. I call it the quality relationship. I gave it a compensatory title equality relationship between all people on this planet. Now, that means that the white supremacists, the white people who have relied on the only systems they have been familiar with, 
and that's the system of white supremacy. There's never been any other system since the beginning of white supremacy that's in place. That's the only government on the planet. You're going to have to replace this system. Replace it with what? Replace it with a system of justice. Now, there's never been a system of justice, so that's unknown. Meaning what? If you talk about the definitions, guaranteeing that no person is mistreated. That's number one. There's two parts. These are, that's what I made up anyway, since there's no official definition for the word justice. But I say a compensatory definition, and I'll hold on to that one until someone comes up with one better. A compensatory definition of the word justice means two parts. One part is guaranteeing that no person is mistreated under any circumstance. You've got to guarantee that. Number two, guarantee that the person that needs help the most gets the most constructive help in every area of activity, economics, education, entertainment, labor, law, politics, religion, sex, and war. That every person that needs help in those areas of activity gets it, the most constructive help, and that nobody is mistreated in the process. Now, that takes some thinking, thinking at a level that has never been done. But that's we got to do things that have never been done. Yes, sir. In order to straighten out this mess, because it's a huge mess that's going to continue. This, this, these things that go on in Ferguson or, or the Trayvon Martin thing, don't even think about that going away. As long as we have these systems in place, I was this morning. I was going through a, a reviewing again, and this is a fast way to learn some things by sometimes looking at movies. I recommend that people look at the movie Gandhi, or look at least at a part of it. And that's when the movie Gandhi, uh, the scene in the movie Gandhi, when Gandhi went to talk to the people who dominated them at the time in India, directly, what they call colonials. I think it was the British, wasn't it? Yes. Yes, mm hmm and so he but, sat there at the table, and they start talking about this general, just like people are talking about Officer Wilson now. And they start saying, well, we'll look into it, and we'll check into it, and we'll... And Gandhi mm -hmm. said, look, when, I'm not coming here to talk about General Dyer. That was the general who had been in charge of a massacre, a massacre mm -hmm. where a lot of women, children, just gunned down, I mean, by the army by the Gurkha army that was under the tutelage of a white general, General Edmund Dyer, Edward Dyer. That was his name. That was April the 13th, 1919. And Gandhi sat there at the table and he says, oh, you're talking about another investigation. See, I didn't come here to talk about another investigation of somebody like General Dyer. And we can say that now. We didn't come here to talk about Officer Wilson. Officer Wilson, even if he was dead, I mean, it would be another Officer Wilson and another Officer Wilson and another Officer Wilson. We're talking about the system that you have here where we don't really have the type of interaction between people every day that we should have in this place called India between the white people who are here and the people who we call our citizens, Indians, Indians, the colonials, and the Indians. We don't have the type of interaction with each other that we should have. All of us, all of you British people who are here, we don't have the type of interaction we should have. Mm -hmm. Or in this case, the United, uh, the, the uh, United in, States. In this case, yeah. the entire world. But We don't but, have the kind of interaction we should have. In other words, people of color do not have the type of interaction with white people that we should have on this entire planet. Okay. Just talking about an Officer Wilson won't cut it. We have to talk about what we do every day. 
It shouldn't be any such thing as a black community. Why is there a black community? Because there is a white community. And why is there a white community? Because of white supremacy. Shouldn't be any of that. We should be people of this planet, universal people. Period. Who but interact that's, with but that's each the way other. we feel. With, you understand what I'm saying? That's the way black people in a feel, but white people manner. have never, ever treated us right. What makes us think that in 29 years, in the next 29 years, that we're going to get to a point where all of a sudden they become human and treat us like humans when they're going to lose power in 2043 because of population. They will no longer control the government. They will no longer be able to control the military. We will be able to put our people in place. And, and, and suppress them in America and Europe. So following Dr. Uh, Francis Cress Welsing's uh, theory that they are afraid of genetic annihilation, they will be at that point in 29 years, which means they're going to have to do something drastic in the next 29 years to reverse this, or they're going to disappear. And that, the white supremacists that, that, ain't get dumb opinion. all of a sudden. They know what's coming, so they're going to have to do something and I don't think black people is paying attention enough to what's got to happen. I think we just ignoring that. You know, this has got to be something horrendous they got planned for us, or else we just going to take over. We just going to you walk asking in and me take a over. Question. Okay, thank you for your call. You okay. want to answer that? Uh, Mr. Fuller, you want to answer that? No, he didn't ask. He said what he thought is going to happen. In 29 what he, years. And what, yes. he, and what he is saying will definitely happen if we continue on the course that we are talking about. Mm -hmm. But I'm saying people have the ability to change. Now, that raises the question, because this is a very important question. Many black people have said it's impossible for white people to change their position with black people. Now, that brings on something that I cannot talk about because I don't know enough about the future wow. or the metabolism mm -hmm. of white people to make that statement. I cannot make that statement. There are people who do make that statement. They say Armageddon is coming. Mm -hmm. That is either going to be all the white people wipe out all of the non-white people on this planet or all of the non-white people gang up on all of the white people on the planet and kill them. Okay, now there are people who do have that in mind because they believe that. I say that could happen and probably would happen if we continue on the course that we have uh, mm -hmm. on. But that I do not assume that white people cannot change. I don't make that assumption, so I'm not in that ballpark. Okay, well, let me ask you this question. Talk about your book and where we can get that. Oh, yeah, your book. you can get the book by yeah. going to ProduceJustice.com. Mm -hmm. And the name because of it. The name of it is The Textbook Workbook for Victims of White Supremacy. If you go to ProduceJustice.com, you'll see that information up there. Oh. How to order the book, the title of the book, a brief description of the book, and the word guide that goes with it, which is an addition to the basic book. Okay. That's ProduceJustice.com. Okay. And the book is about what black people what non-white people, people of color, mm -hmm. can do every day, wherever they are. And I'm giving out some of the information right now. Right now, yes, sir. And I've said over and over again, because it's in the book, one thing you don't do, you don't riot, because you suffer from the riots that you engage in. Yes, sir. And the people anywhere that they are who are rioting, they're going to see that after that riot is over. All right. Because, see, it's not just the rioting. It's what happens after the riot. Go out there and take a look at that wreckage and then start seeing what you got. All righty. Talk team at radio.com. Check us out on WCRS FM 98.3 Wednesday and Sunday evenings. Blogs and podcasts are available. Download Talk team at radio.com after your cell or tablet. We go where you go. Radio the way it should be heard. Stay right there. We're going to get, try to get into the Bill Cosby situation and more of your calls coming up next on Talk team at radio.com.
TalkTainmentRadio.com is the premier internet radio platform offering 40 plus talk radio style programs professionally produced, optimized for online distribution, featuring Columbus, Ohio on air personalities. TalkTainmentRadio.com offers listeners diverse programming options covering topics such as arts and culture, love, life and relationships, technology, religion, paranormal activities, local and national politics, women's issues, alongside health and wellness. Listeners can access their favorite TalkTainmentRadio.com programs free of cost through the website. Download the TTR app to your cell phone and you can take us wherever you go. We have programs on demand to fit your schedule through our podcast. The address is TalkTainmentRadio.com. We can give you a new heart. We can help you walk again. We can perform brain surgery. We can treat a sore throat. We can bring life into the world. We can work so many miracles. But the one thing we cannot do is read your mind. When you communicate with your doctor. When you ask us more questions. You reduce your risk of suffering a medical mistake. Tens of thousands of lives are lost every year due to medical mistakes. The healthcare community is working on it. But you can help. Please, open up. Ask more questions. What are the side effects? When should I expect my test results? Will this medication interact with my other prescriptions? We can't answer if you don't ask. Help reduce your risk. Questions are the answer. Learn the 10 questions you must ask. Visit www.ahrq.gov. This message brought to you by the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality, and the Ad Council. In the small town of Elmira, New York, a boy was born into an all-American family. The odds of him opening his own clothing store at the age of 18? One in 138,000. Excited to be a part of pop culture, he packed for the big city. The odds of him achieving his dream in the fashion industry? One in 23 million. The odds of having a child diagnosed with autism? One in 68. I am Tommy Hilfiger, and my family is affected by autism. I encourage you to learn more at autismspeaks.org slash signs. Early diagnosis can make a lifetime of difference. Brought to you by Autism Speaks, the Ad Council, and TalkTainmentRadio.com, the world's greatest radio. Goodwill is a global social services enterprise and the leading nonprofit provider of job training programs and career services in the United States and Canada. To pay for its program, Goodwill sells donated clothes and other household items in more than 2,700 stores and online at shopgoodwill.com. Goodwill uses the revenue earned from these sales to fund job training, employment placement services, and other community programs. The goal of the campaign is to increase goods donations to Goodwill, inspire an emotional connection to the Goodwill brand, and to elevate preference for Goodwill. Will. Supporting minority education. I'm Sean Booker, damn it, from The Melting Pot. I'm here to tell you that as the mother of a high school senior, I know due to financial circumstances, many of America's deserving minority students do not have access to a college education. Since 1944, the United Negro College Fund has sought to provide one. Since 1972, the beginning of this campaign, UNCF has helped more than 300,000 talented students earn a college degree. I'm Sean Booker, damn it. Give a helping hand. The United Independent Compensatory Code System concept by Neely Fuller is considered as one of the substantial and basic books for understanding and effectively countering racism. Neely Fuller will turn upside down everything you've heard and everything you think you know about racism and how it works. Call area code 202-484-5461. 202-484-5461. I'm as mad as hell, and I'm not going to take this anymore. Go ahead. Make my day. You got the power. Talk to him at radio.com, the world's greatest radio, and that's radio the way it should be heard. This is Mr. Bobby, along with uh, Mr. Nearly Fuller, and this is the compensatory concept. And you can get in contact with the show if you can get in by calling 1 877 932 9766. Okay, um, I do want to get into the Bill Cosby situation, but the phone lines are jumping, so I need to go to line number three. Go ahead, line number three. You are on with Mr. Nearly Fuller. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, first off, t- 
to that last caller, uh, I'm just going to say this briefly, and Mr. Fuller can respond to this later after I make my other comments. Um, but in terms of uh, what happens uh, 29 years from now, I mean, if that's the projected date, uh, whenever we hear different time frames for it, but whatever the case, I mean, if you look around the world right now, um, whites are in a minority. And the fact is, if you go along with uh, Mr. Fuller's uh, 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 hypothesis, a theory that uh, white supremacists rule the world and control the world, then what makes us think that it's going to be any different here in this country, in this nation in particular, uh, in that time frame? I think we've always been looking at this from the standpoint, from a numerical advantage, that if we have the majority, we have the numbers uh, that we can rule and control. But we look, we look at South Africa up uh, through the uh, end of apartheid and see that the white minority rule there. On a, that's on a smaller level. And I know one thing that Mr. Fuller's talked about you, uh, before is black people, we're the only people who believe that uh, if we're in the majority, Majority, if it's a lot of us around, that we have some sense of power. And he put it aptly that a white supremacist can come in, be only one or two of them, and they can control the whole situation. And he's basically saying that a crowd of black people is just a crowd of black people, just like it was on a slave ship. And I think that's what we need to keep in mind when we start thinking and talking about in terms of uh them becoming a numerical minority, whether in this country or anywhere else on the planet. Okay, now, now we're on limited time, so go ahead and ask okay, your question. Okay, so let me, let, me, let me wrap this up and just, just synthesize in everything here, because I think this needs to be said, and I'm going to say this real quickly and get off, because I know your lines are loaded. But um, over the past few weeks, we've seen Adrian Peterson, Bill Cosby, who I know you're about to touch upon, and we see again uh, right now what happened in Ferguson. What this shows, this synthesizes, this proves everything that what Mr. Fuller has been saying right here on this show, and I hope everybody listening right now, callers, everyone, takes heed to this. He said we have no leadership or we have or a bunch of spokespersons. He said that uh, we have no power. The white supremacist give us, and he can take us away. Bill Cosby, his show and syndication even was pulled off. He's been pulled back. They pull him back everything on him. You talk about Adrian Peterson, top running back, one of the top players in the league, tops in jersey sales. He's pulled away from the league. Now we see with the Mike Brown. It didn't matter how many people protested or got out there and said no justice, no peace, or whatever, and this cannot happen. This is 2014. It happened again, and it's what we keep failing to realize. This is a test that we're in, and because we have not passed this test, it's why we have to keep repeating it over and over and over again. So at some point, we're going to have to do something completely different, as he's been saying all along. I completely agree, and I hope the listeners out there finally take heed and start reading the book and listening to all these things and just stop asking the same questions over and over and over again because we keep going in circles repeatedly, unfortunately. Okay. So I hope everyone pays attention to everything that happens on a large scale and small scale that we don't learn from this. We're going to keep repeating it, and that's the ultimate message that has to be put forth. All right. Thank you for your call. Let's go to call line number six. Can well, I be heard? Yes, you can be heard. Uh, thank you, uh Brother Bobby, for taking my call. I'd like to uh, send greetings to Mr. Fuller, and I appreciate um, the time that he spends coming on and sharing his um, wisdom. I know he doesn't like to call it that with us. It's been a few years, Mr. Fuller, since I've spoken to you, and in that time, um, I have actually used your work um, to talk to young people. I had a group of young people just last night that I presented your book too. Um, they were in the age group of 14, 15, and 16. So for me, the caller before this gentleman, who I think was exceptionally uh, on point, uh, caller number three, uh, his comments about what's going to happen in 29 years, almost impossible to determine that. What we do have control over is the information that we have access to and using that information to determine exactly how the system has impacted those of us who are in my age group and the kids that are coming along. The young men and women I spoke with yesterday are excited about your book and about the possibilities. They tend to think that because I can speak about it, that they'll be able to pull that together and do it too. I've got a lot of other things I've read before I read your material, but your material crystallized for me the system of racism and white supremacy. So what I was going to ask Mr. Fuller, in the context of what's happening in Ferguson, what happened in Staten Island, I'm sure you have some issues down in the D.C. area that are very similar to the situation that we're talking about. Um, black men and women coming together and using the courts, using the law, 
uh, out in Maddox talks about this constantly. Either we are going to confront the fact that the law doesn't work for us, and there are a lot of non-white people who tend to think that it's a hit or miss, that it does work sometimes. I tend to think that it only works if it supports the system of racism and white supremacy, even if that support benefits the black person now and then. Overall, it doesn't work to our advantage, doesn't work to our benefit. But understanding that and using foot power, using um, group power, getting the collective together, getting to the place where we may one day be able to call community and going down to the city halls at the local level and pressuring those people to say no to those genuine concerns that we have. And this is what I've gotten from you over the years. Ask for what you need, take what's given, and then make sure that everyone who needs that assistance knows we did ask for it. This is what they provided us. And these are the reasons they said they wouldn't give us all mm-hmm. that was necessary. Okay. I think that that would be pressure points that okay. we can use to sort of highlight okay. the uh, racists that are running the system that we we're, live under. We're going to let Mr. Fuller respond to that. You care to respond to that, Mr. Fuller? Well, if I understand what he's saying, uh, in the conglomerate, uh, what black people, if I understand what he's saying, what black people need is a counter-racist code that covers every area of activity. But what do I mean by a code? I mean things that you do, things that you don't do, things that you say, things that you don't say. Just like I just gave one illustration. Neely Fuller is not going out and participate in any riots. I'm not going to throw a rock because I know that that's not what they say in the mafiosa, good business. See, in other words, racism is a business. Counter-racism should be a business, but counter-racism doesn't exist because the racists are codified. They have a code. Every white person that believes in racism has a racist code. And sometimes they make mistakes, but for the most part, the racist code works. It's the most successful business in the world. Now, counter-racism, meaning the people who are against racism, don't have a code. We're just as sloppy as we can be. We just go out and do anything any kind of old way and just hope that it works out. That's why we will think that throwing a firebomb into a filling station is going to solve our problems. It's not. All that means is you're going to have to go further to get some gasoline. You're going to find that out when you do it. You're going to find it out when you do it. If you burn down the grocery store, it means you've got to go 16 blocks now to get a quart of milk for grandmother. That's what that means. And you're going to sit on the curb and watch the rats go through all that wreckage across the street from your house, and you're not going to gain anything from that. You're just destroying things. If you stop and think about it and be logical, which is what we need in a counter-racist code, logic, that's the one thing that's missing. Logic. We're not yes. logical. Yes. We don't understand cause and effect. Yes, because the pictures that I saw and have seen were just disgusting to see people burning stuff in their own neighborhoods, but in particular, robbing, I mean, you know, stealing liquor, uh, liquor stores and all that getting kind of drunk. I, Yeah, getting, getting drunk. Stealing something to get drunk yeah, with, it, it, in the middle in the middle of what you call fighting for a yes, cause. Yes, yes, it was, it was now, terrible. Now, look, look at the logic of that. I got a bottle, two bottles of liquor, and I say, I got back at the man. <laughs> I done took something from the man. The man wants me to have that bottle of liquor. That's why he had it there in the first place. I mean, we don't think. We are not the greatest thinkers in the world, which is why we are in the shape that we are in. Yes, We yes. need to be thoughtful and just think not just about what's happening right on the surface. Think about what's going to be happening two weeks from now. Two years from now, two millenniums from now, because the white supremacists think at that level. Absolutely. They already know what black people are going to do when they riot, and they know how far the riot is going to go. (laughs) They sure do. (laughs) They sure do. They know how far the riot is going to go, and they know who the riot is going to hurt most. It's going to hurt (laughs) people (laughs) of color most. If you don't believe it, look around you. Look around. All right, let's go to line number two. Line number two, go ahead. Hello, uh, Mr. Bobby and uh, Mr. Fuller. Uh, thanks for having the show. 
Good morning to you both. Good morning. Uh, two comments. Uh, or make, uh, really, make, make them quick because we're, we're jammed, so make them real quick, please. Got you. Not a comment, more so a question. Mr. Fuller, I want to get back to um, if we really know the real numbers of white people, are they telling us the truth um, <laughs> about what the numbers that they have and also the number of resources? Because I know you always say that to get uh, to produce justice, um, you know, we need to focus and give the most attention to the people who need it the most or that person that may need it the most. So if we were to do that, do we really have those resources or, mm-hmm. you know, good, good. how can we figure that out? Good question. Oh, the question is what now? Uh, I didn't get the cogency of the question. Uh, um, well, I really want to know more so on your, your philosophy or what you're trying to do when you say get the resources or give the most amount of help to the people who need it most. It's something you said before and past. Um, so I'm trying to figure out if we know the real numbers of our resources, if we were to go forth with that, mm-hmm. are they telling us? And do we know the real number of white people? Because I've also hear that it's 1% controlling things or that we, if we have peace, then uh, uh, we would, you know, wipe them out essentially and things of that that type of nature, um, but we don't really know. I feel like we might not know their numbers. Okay. It, uh, I, uh, uh, if I understand the question, I have to say this about the numbers. Okay. The numbers don't mean anything. Okay. It's what's going on in people's minds means everything. The most powerful people in the world are not great in number, but they are powerful mm. because they are thinkers. The people who, who who do some thinking will always, if it's ten people in a room, the person who does the most thinking is going to be the dominant person in that room, not the person who's just running around turning flips and grinning and, and clowning and whatnot and never doing any thinking, never doing any thinking. It's the person who just sits still and figures things out. Now, when I say thinking, I mean what? Thinking about what? How to get things done. That's all it is. It's simple. All right. But the victims of racism have not been thinkers, but it's understandable because we have never been told to think. We have been told not to think. That's the first thing you do with people when you mm. conquer them. It's tell mm. them, don't do any thinking. A thinking slave is a dangerous slave. Hmm. You're listening to the Compensatory Concept on TalkTainmentRadio.com with Mr. Neely Fuller. And if you have uh, any questions, you can call in by, by calling one eight seven seven nine three two nine seven six six. Okay, call your second question, and then we'll move on. Um, just real quick, uh, Mr. Fuller, um, is there any, do you have an email or another line? Is that something that's on the website as well um, to maybe ask you any more questions off the air? And if so, uh, maybe that's something I can get off the air by... By one of the producers, I don't know, uh, but that was my last question. Okay, thank you. Yeah, is there another way to get in contact with you, uh, Mr. Fuller? Well, uh, not at the time because okay. I, a lot of people contact me directly and whatnot, but I, I haven't been encouraging that too much because I can't stay on the phone all the time. <laughs> all right. Yeah. And uh, uh, yes, I have a pretty heavy. Uh, list of things, to-do lists, yeah. which we all should have. Yes. Yes, we all should okay. have pretty heavy to-do lists because right. there's a lot of things that need doing. Mm-hmm. There's a lot of problems to be solved because I'd, I'd like to say this, that should be black people's focus. In fact, I have coined a codified phrase, solve problems without making any. Yeah, that's and, a nice and that And that yes. would go excellent for the people who are in Ferguson right now. Everybody who goes there and everybody who's already there, do some thinking. Try to solve problems without making any. Mm. And that means you've got to sit quietly and do some thinking. Not just go out in the streets and just rally. I mean, I can understand that. And shout slogans. Because black people, as far back as I can remember, agreed on slogans. Black power, fist in the air. You know, let's make some noise. In fact, we use that expression. That's the slogan. Mm -hmm. That's a standard black slogan. Mm -hmm. Let's make some noise. No, we need to make some music. Music is different from noise. Now, what's the difference between music and noise? 
music helps you to think about doing things in a constructive manner. That's what music is. That is the definition of music, really. The compensatory definition that I've given it is thinking that results in doing constructive things. And if you are not doing constructive things, it means you are doing noise. You are making noise. And noise is non-constructive. Noise keeps you from doing constructive things. This is why people sometimes, when they are having brain surgery, they'll say, hey, cut off that noise in the next room. I'm working on this person's brain. I have to know what I'm doing. I have to be able to concentrate. So I don't want noise. Yes. I'm in here working on this person's brain, and I have to make music because this is musical. Doing something constructive is always musical. That's the difference between music and noise. There's two types of sound in the universe, music and noise. What's the difference? Music is when you're doing or saying something constructive. That's what music is. Noise is when you're doing something that's non-constructive. All righty. Uh, before we go to the next caller, I, I need to get this out. I'm not going to be able to get to the Bill Cosby uh, story like I want to. There were some excerpts that I wanted to read, but I'm not going to be able to do that because of the uh, phone calls, which I'm very glad. But I will tell you this. <laughs> you can you can get the information from freeyourmindandthink.com. And when you read that, you'll, you'll be, you can begin to understand how Mr. Bill Cosby has been set up. But free your mind, uh, and think dot com is one site. And to give you a little brief history of what you think is going on, you need to uh, investigate the 1967 U.S. Liberty incident. And once you see that, and, and if you can stand to look at it, you'll understand exactly what Mr. Fuller has been speaking about, because it speaks directly to uh, the racist and white supremacist and how they do and what they do. So that's the U.S. Liberty, 1967 U.S. Liberty uh, incident. Check that out. And also, for the Bill Cosby uh, uh, information, you can contact freeyourmindandthink.com, and they vest everything. They have a disclaimer right there on the thing. They would not put it out if it wasn't true. And they give you the sources, by the way, of that information, so you can look that up if you care to. Okay, let's go to line number three. Go ahead, uh, caller. Oh, good morning. Can I be heard? Yes, you can. Uh, good morning, Bobby. Good morning, Mr. Fuller. Um, first and foremost, I actually want to thank both of you for what you've been doing and what you continue to do. Uh, I find it to be extremely constructive. And uh, with that said, I do have two brief questions uh, I'd like to ask. Okay, go ahead. Um, to Mr. Fuller, did you begin putting your book or your works together before you started uh, attending Elijah Muhammad's um, speeches? Or after? I'll say, I'll say that again. The question is... Oh, did you begin putting your works together before you started attending Elijah Muhammad's speeches? Or did they come after that? Oh, they came before that. Uh, I, I was writing in 1957. I had never heard of Muslims at all. In fact, the first Muslim that I encountered was at Andrews Air Force Base. And in the late 1950s, uh, uh, right after I started writing in Japan, the compensatory code, and uh, he, uh, uh, there was a person, a sergeant in the military, who said he was a Muslim. And I said, Muslim? Uh, what are you talking about? You're saying Muslim? He said, no, I'm saying I'm a Muslim. He said, Muslim is somebody else's term. See, that's not what I call myself. I call myself a Muslim. I never heard the term Muslim. I never heard the term Muslim. I mean, in 1957, and uh, and and or in 58 or 59. That's when I encountered this this gentleman, and uh, and I had already started writing my material uh, before then, uh, and so. He said, uh, well, I'd like for you to come to the mosque. Of course, uh, you know, I said, mosque. I said, what's that? He said, well, I'll show you. I'll, do, I'll just walk you through it. Uh, but then what he also told me in that conversation, that initial conversation, 
about him being a Muslim. He also uh, told me that I was a Muslim. And I said, you know, I said, no, I I used to call myself a Baptist. I mean, I said, but I don't call myself that anymore because I wasn't telling the truth when I called myself that. So that's what I told him, which was the truth. You always start with the truth. And then he started telling me about the nation of Islam and Elijah Muhammad. And I'd never heard of it, uh, you know. So this always came after what I started writing. Okay. Right. And your second question, sir? Oh, my second question is, did he get anything constructive out of uh, Mr. Uh, Muhammad's uh, speeches? Okay, thank you for your call. Thank you. Did you get any, uh, he was asking, did you get anything constructive out of Mr. Muhammad's speeches? Oh, yes, of course. I've gotten something constructive out of Marcus Garvey, out of Elijah Muhammad, out of Malcolm X, out of everybody. People ask me, what are your influences? I said, everybody, from Mark Twain. I used to, I read Huckleberry Finn at least 12 times. Hmm. Okay. Right, Huckleberry Finn, I mean, complete with the N-word, I mean, and all like that. Wow. I like that, I like that, uh, that novel, uh, Huckleberry Finn, there's a lot of lessons in there. Mm -hmm. So you have to know how to look for lessons in things. Okay. And don't get spaced out by just the words. Don't let words dominate you. Learn okay. how to dominate words. Uh, I learned that early on. A couple things. Uh, again, the title of your book and where we can get it before we go to the next caller? Uh, ProduceJustice.com. That's how people can get it. What will come up on the screen is a brief description of the basic textbook for victims of white supremacy and an additional codified, compensatory codified, counter-racist word guide. Because how you use words are very important. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And again, somebody just asked me about that Bill Cosby thing. Uh, you can get that from uh, freeyourmindandthink.com. They they have it on there, the complete story to give you the perspective of what's going on. The model was saying that she was paid to destroy Bill Cosby, so you need to look at that to shape your opinion. And also the 1967 U.S. Liberty incident, you need to look at that and, and understand to get a perspective on what's going on. Okay, caller number three. Go ahead with your call for Mr. Fuller. Oh, excuse yes, me, sir. caller yes, number sir. six. Hello? Okay, go ahead. Mm -hmm. Hello? Yes, yes good, morning. Uh, mm -hmm. good morning. Good uh, morning. Great to speak to you, uh, Mr. Fuller. Um, it, it's, uh, you know, I, I, I agree with 99%, 99.99% uh, .99 of most of what you say, but I do have one objection to some of your teaching. Um, the, the fact that you mentioned, uh, you always mention people of color and non-white people, but I, as a black person, I would, I would refrain from, uh, putting myself in the category of people of color, also non-white non people, only because I've gotten a lot more racist remarks uh, from folks who, who are so-called non-white. <clears throat> uh, may it be folks from South America, or may it be folks from um, the uh, Muslim countries. So w w what are your views about this? Is, is it okay to uh, for one not to refer to oneself as people of color and, and the straight calling ourselves black or African. Well, well, if I understand your question, the non-white people of this planet are, and I say it in my book, pitiful, primitive, stupid, and or silly. That's how I describe us. That's what we are. And I think I'm telling the truth when I say it. I'll start with them again, those four characteristics. Pitiful. In other words, we are worthy of pity with the shape that we are in, our minds and our bodies, all over this world. And then we are primitive, meaning we are in a prime stage. We're not in an advanced stage. We're not this great people that we always try to pretend to be. We're some sorry people. And with that... I'm sorry, but our time has run out. Thank you, Mr. Fuller. TalkTainmentRadio.com, the world's greatest radio and radio the way it should be heard. We'll see you next week, and we'll try harder to be better. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Mr. Thanks Fuller. Thanks for listening to The Compensatory Concept with Mr. Neely Fuller, heard exclusively on TalkTainmentRadio.com, the world's greatest radio. The most important question in all racial matters is why one should always ask it. Radio, the way it should be heard. You.
got the power. <laughs> 